and welcome back to Game Escape. Today we are going to be talking about pachinko video games. And if you are an importer of games, you've certainly seen these titles floating around. There have been numerous releases in this genre for every system from the Super Famicom at least onward. And a couple of years ago I, I, I sort of got interested in pachinko and what what is this game? Why are there video games dedicated to it. What is the charm about this? And, and in the process I uh, did some research into Pachinko the game and the industry and found out some really really fascinating information. Pachinko is incredibly widespread in Japan and based on what you read it is an industry of tremendous tremendous scale. Uh, estimates suggest that it takes in 225 to 300 billion dollars a year and of course with such a game that is widely popular it's only natural that there are video games dedicated to it and so I started importing a couple if I could find them at a decent price and I thought I would would share some of these games with you today now there are too many pachinko games out there for all the systems and I, I can't really give kind of a synthetic overview of the evolution of the genre completely but I think the four games that I've selected will kind of show you where the pachinko game genre has been and where it is today and in the process kind of show you what these games are about and what pachinko is about so to do that I think a good place to start is with Jison Pachinko Hishouhu Twin for the Sega Saturn. I, I hope I got somewhere near the right pronunciation on that. This is a game I picked up uh, on eBay for about four or five dollars and it was really my introduction to the game. And so while it, it, it may not be obviously the most representative title for what's out there today I think it's a fair enough representation of the game to be useful um, what is the objective of Pachinko? Well it is like vertical pinball, it's actually based on a French game called Bagatelle and what you're doing is propelling balls into the playing field using a dial on the right hand side of the machine. If you turn the dial to the right the speed at which the balls are launched into the play field is increased and of course so is the, the the direction kind of shifts to the right you turn the dial to the left the balls will kind of float to the left and the objective is to get it into this little scoring area in the bottom center of the playing field and when you do that you'll initiate today anyway a slot machine type game now with this one it is the classic slot machine setup um, when you go to a, a kind of modern day pachinko parlor and then you play a modern machine um, there'll just be a big LCD display with lots of different uh, symbols numbers and characters on it that you have to match up what I think the charm of, of this game is if you like pachinko and you're in Japan is that you get two machines, two real-life machines that behave as these machines do in real life and what you can do is track your stats over time and see how the machine behaves and see how see what kind of success you have playing the machine. You can change the um, odds, you can change the pin configuration and just essentially track your progress. Um, now obviously that suggests that there's a time horizon for the usefulness of these games. If, you know, for example, this uh, Saturn title is uh, really not going to help you today because I'm assuming that these machines have been pulled from the parlors many, many years ago. One of the other kind of secondary aspects of this game is that it gives you a parlor creator. You can actually create your own parlor and you simulate, in this case you're the little gold star, and you kind of simulate what it's like to be in a parlor. You fight to get the good machine, 
but you will only ever play the two machines offered on the disc and you can set things like the price of the balls, the opening and closing times and things like that. So uh, the formula remains more or less unchanged in the more modern pachinko games but the objective is always the same. Try to get as many balls as you can into this little scoring area that will win you more balls Started, it starts a slot machine if you line up different numbers, symbols, or characters on the slot machine um, you win more balls and uh, you don't actually win cash because as I understand it it is illegal to gamble in Japan so you essentially just bring your balls, uh, your, your winnings to the front of a, of a parlor and they give you a little gift then you take that gift outside to some secondary establishment, hand the gift in, and they give you your winnings in cash. So that is essentially the objective of Pachinko, and we will move on now and look at some more recent games in the genre. So as fun as it may sound to be preoccupied with winning balls, the mechanics of Pachinko are very simple and after a while there's really almost no point to continue sitting in front of the TV screen if you find the sweet spot for the dial you can just more or less leave it there and let the game play out by itself but that's where a game like Pachinko Paradise 11 comes in this game offers a story mode an actual uh, kind of JRPG to kind of surround the core pachinko mechanic and strangely it, it works. You play the role of a lone uh, pachi pro and, and this is an actual term in Japan. Apparently there's a, a subset of pachinko players who believe that they can actually play pachinko for a living. So you are this, this lone pro and you're kind of traveling around the countryside and you uh, you basically find a, a parlor out in a small town and this parlor has uh, an accident. A truck actually drives through it and it's kind of up to you to solve the mystery and it's just, at least that's what I can gather from it. Again, I don't really speak Japanese but I think the the narrative is not all that involved and and so that's the deal um, you help a very stereotypical anime looking proprietor of the establishment a young girl and you bla basically play competitively against some of the other opponents that crop up in the game and uh, you're, you're going to only play here two machines. They are, they are two versions of a tropical themed or underwater themed pachinko machine from Sanyo. So it, it's, again, you're, you're never going to get more than two. But having this story mode actually makes things much more interesting. You, act, you have a reason to play. And as you can see here, the, the graphics on the machine are vastly improved over the... Uh, Saturn version, and you can zoom in on on the screen. Um, the it seems like the odds here are not the standard pachinko machine odds. The first couple of battles, and it seems like you're getting a lot of uh, rolls of the slot machine. You're having a lot of success, but if you are going to sit down and play pachinko or a pachinko video game for a while, this is this is a pretty good way to do it and I've played maybe through four or five of, of the missions here and it, it, it does induce you to keep playing. Um, I can't say that I'm a fan of the, the theme of the machine it, and the music can get a little irritating. You have this mermaid girl that constantly pops up and tells you that you're lucky and you continue playing. When when you're in jackpot mode um, on these games, there's actually a slot down below that, that opens up. 
and if you get balls into that, you know, you really multiply your score. So the, the of course, the other nice thing about this one is that you can really, really zoom in, really get a good look at the pin layout, almost down to the individual pin, and, and really follow the path of the ball um, as it travels down to the scoring area. So, um, Pachinko Paradise is, I think, there, there's 17 iterations of it, I believe, and it, it is one of the more, uh, probably the most popular of the Pachinko video game series. And, uh, I mean, if you can stand the somewhat grating music and Mermaid Girl, it's actually a pretty fun game if you have any interest in Pachinko, because it actually gives you a reason to play and a reason to continue the story. And continuing with the Pachinko Paradise series, we have Pachipara 17. At some point they just shorten Pachinko Paradise to Pachipara. And this is the same kind of deal. You're, you get two underwater themed machines, this time featuring actually an American model named Agnes Lamb, who I guess was pretty popular in Japan in the 70s and 80s perhaps, and the structure of the machine remains pretty much the same to the one that you saw in Pachinko Paradise 11. Of course this being on the PlayStation 3, the model on the machine is a lot more detailed, um, obviously high res, and you can sort of spin it around and have a, a close-up look at it and it, the, the fidelity remains pretty good. Uh, again, the mechanics of, of Pachinko are the same. Just turn that dial, try to find the sweet spot, and basically just uh, hope to get the ball into uh, the scoring area underneath the, the big LCD screen. It's it, it will never change, although here I actually think that the game feels a little bit more sluggish, surprisingly, compared to the, the PS2 release. It, as you are zooming in and moving the camera around the machine, it slows down a little bit. Um, I'm not sure why exactly that is, but uh, you will notice it on this one. And I would have thought, purchasing the latest game in the series, that perhaps you would get the, the kind of high, highest quality scanning and zooming, but uh, that is really not the case here. Um, the game sadly does away with the RPG element that we saw in version 11, and, and here it replaces it with an online battle mode. Now, I was not able to go online with it. I couldn't seem to find an opponent, so I was just matched up against the computer and the objective here is to reach certain milestones on the game before your opponent get more spins obviously win more more balls get certain what they call reaches where you get two of the three symbols that you need that's considered a reach and then basically you will uh, you know see what happens they have different different machines have different animations for how you get that 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 third symbol or that third number and you just compete and whoever gets the most these are almost like mini achievements whoever gets the most mini achievements in a given period of time is the winner but again I I couldn't really get online I'm not sure how fun that would ultimately be because pachinko is not really a game of skill you're just basically playing against the algorithms in in the machine and every time you get the ball into the scoring area the result is ultimately predetermined so I'm not exactly certain what what going online would would add to the experience and it's kind of a shame that they ditched the story mode because again that at least that gives you some reason to keep playing and lastly, we're going to take a look at Bikuri Pachinko Ashida no Jo, also for the PlayStation 3. Now, this is a game, a pachinko game, the pachinko machine, based on the Ashida no Jo anime series. 
and here you get you get two versions of the same machine a regular version and a max version they have slightly different odds and I guess payout schemes and the, the game lacks any kind of story mode any kind of online mode but what it does offer is some really great music and animation and there, there is actually a narrative in the machine you're you're basically every time you spin you have to line up one of, of nine characters and each has an individual story now this game is is kind of interesting it in addition to having the the kind of standard dial mechanic if you hit the L1 button you get this enter button with uh, four directional buttons and it's not clear to me exactly what uh, what you're supposed to do with it it doesn't seem to have any effects I thought that maybe when the two exclamation points flashed on the screen that I should hit the enter button but it didn't seem to have any effect on on the results of the spins and uh, I wasn't winning any more um, than not pressing it, so I'm not clear what it does. On this machine, the uh, there's actually a gameplay mechanic here. Basically, you have to start out shooting balls to the left, and once you, you trigger a jackpot scenario, you actually have to shoot them all the way to the right of the screen. And when you're in the jackpot scenario, each jackpot scenario is a fight. And if you, you, you win the fight, you kind of extend that and you, you get it into that, that sort of supplemental scoring area and rack up the balls. So um, that's basically it. But I found myself playing this one a little bit more because I actually did want to see if I could get all nine stories and the music was fun it's kind of you know catchy so even though this is fairly limited in its offerings um, I still found myself playing a little bit more than Pachipara 17 and again and even like the Saturn title you can change the odds you can you have really really in-depth stat tracking but in this one, um, the I guess the the in machine story mode is the draw, and this is a strangely expensive game on eBay. I, I remember paying eighty five dollars for it new. I don't know why I, I did that. It was some sort of crazy late night play Asia impulse buy. But now on eBay used, I've seen it go for as high as I think $175 new it's it's $200 although it, it actually brings up a really interesting point about the market for pachinko games you will see that they are very very expensive they're 70 to $110 new now if, if you're looking on play Asia eBay's got them like I said all, all over the, the grid for some of the newer ones the Yoshida no Joe one is super expensive but you never see any sold listings for them, so I'm not sure who's buying them, if anyone, and what what justifies the super high price. And it's not just Japanese sellers who have got them at a at an incredibly high price. It's also U.S. based sellers. So it's it's kind of a strange marketplace for these games. Now, Pachinko is not a game of skill. It's a game that you know might essentially play itself, you just find that sweet spot, like I said, walk away. Are these games worth playing and owning and importing, and, and what is the ultimate pleasure of these games? Well, we'll start in reverse order. I think, as I understand it, having played them now for a while, the, the idea here is that these are emulations of real pachinko machines, and as such, they behave just like those machines. And if you are a pachinko player in Japan, you, you're always looking to, to know the complete behavior of a machine over a course of time. It, it changes based on how many jackpots have been won and, and how many spins have been achieved. So 
I guess if you're really into this stuff, you you want to just keep on playing and, and seeing how the machine responds, so you know exactly what to look for, what what is really the best time to sit down and play one of these in real life. I think the second attraction of these games to people who like pachinko is probably the ability to manipulate the odds and actually see the whole range of animation and reach scenarios that the machines offer. And then I guess if you like the license, you know, there's Evangelion, Pachinko games, um, basically if, if it's a popular anime license it probably has, a, it certainly has a Pachinko machine if not a Pachinko game. So, you know, you know I guess if, if you were a collector of, of that particular series it's, it's probably uh, a cool thing to own the, the pachinko game. As, as a western player though, I'm not really sure how much this will, will appeal to you. I mean, it it really... There, there's there, there are really nothing... There's nothing to these games. There's, there's no mechanic that makes it interesting. There's no reason to come back to it. Even if you want to just track your stats over a couple different playthroughs. There's there's no culturally compelling reason to play them. Pachinko games, I think, are ultimately curiosities. But I, I will say that Pachinko itself is, is kind of fascinating. The, the more I've read about it, it is a, a habit that has developed really since World War II. And, and, and a lot of people argue because of, of the really two things. That there's a, a kind of stifling nature of Japanese work culture and people search for an escape. And the pachinko parlors offer that. There's this just wave of, of sound and color and apparently people go in there to lose themselves in, in this digital mechanical escapism. And... You know, Japan being a, a train faring culture, and there's always a lot of foot traffic, pachinko machines and pachinko parlors are supposedly everywhere, so this avenue of escape has become kind of omnipresent. And I, th I think that's interesting, the, the, the ability to just sit in front of one of these machines and detach from reality. And so when you play these at home here in the West, you have to keep that that kind of cultural specificity of these machines in, in mind and you know maybe you want to I actually play them rather than sitting and, and reclining on the couch with the controller I actually try to sit kind of nearer to the screen the way you would in a, in a pachinko parlor I and mean, you're sitting right on top of these things and allowing the, the kind of light and color and sound to just surround you so if you, if you do that you kind of have a better idea of how it feels to play one of these in real life, I, I would imagine. And, you know, try it uh, when you're stressed, or, you know, when, when you want to come home, long week of work, have a drink or two, play one of these games, and I think you then approach the appeal of Pachinko, and, and maybe you can get an understanding for, uh, of it, but at, at the super high prices that these games command, I, I can't really recommend them to anyone but hardcore collectors who just need to, to see what this genre is all about, or maybe people who, who collect trophies, because you can get all sorts of trophies from these games. But it's just, it's been fun for me to, to kind of look at these games and look at the pachinko craze in Japan, and it's it's been a, an interesting learning experience but not one that I can, can really recommend to people into uh, import gaming. It's, it's just uh, way too expensive for the enjoyment offered. Thanks for watching Game Escape, and we'll see you again.